April 1981. Columbia, the first space shuttle orbiter glides to a pinpoint landing at Edwards Air Force Base, California, ending its spectacular maiden flight. But unlike spacecraft that had gone before, Columbia would not be retired from service to become a museum piece. Its future as a space transport vehicle had only begun. After its successful first flight, Columbia was ferried back to Kennedy Space Center. There, the process of turnaround was set in motion. There were system checkouts, minor tile repairs and replacements. An experiments package called OSTA-1 was placed in the payload bay. The package rests on a platform built by the European Space Agency. The Canadian-built remote manipulator system was installed. The system includes a 50-foot-long mechanical arm. In early August, Columbia was moved over to the Vehicle Assembly Building. Here it was mated to two new solid rocket boosters and an external fuel tank. Three weeks later, it was rolled to the launch pad once again. Shuttle Flight 1 brought many firsts. Shuttle Flight 2 would bring another. The first time in the history of space flight that an attempt would be made to launch the same spacecraft a second time. During the next three weeks, launch preparation crews worked in three shifts trying to meet the early October launch date. All had gone smoothly up to the point of loading the hypergolic fuels. That process had barely begun when nitrogen tetroxide was discovered spilling onto the orbiter. Approximately 15 to 20 gallons of the oxidizer had spilled down the side of the vehicle and into the propellant tank compartment of the nose section. It had also seeped between the orbiter's thermal protection system tiles and dissolved the bond holding the tiles on the spacecraft. Eventually, over 350 had to be removed. The cause of the spill was failure of a quick disconnect valve to close. The valve could not close because of concentrations of iron nitrate in the head and hardening of lubrication in that area. With Columbia still on the launch pad, workers were able to gain access inside the nose compartment and replace soaked thermal blankets. They were also able to reach the soaked tiles. Therefore, it would not be necessary to move back to the orbiter processing facility for repairs. The tiles were put through a very speedy decontamination process to remove the oxidizer. Within three weeks after the spill, all 378 tiles had been removed, decontaminated, and rebonded. Launch was rescheduled for November 4th. But Columbia was not destined to return to space yet. Only 31 seconds away from ignition, the launch computer halted the countdown. The pressure in the liquid oxygen tank was below the predetermined limit necessary for liftoff. Meanwhile, controllers were also becoming increasingly concerned about the high oil pressure in two of the three auxiliary power units. After analyzing this problem further, they decided to scrub the launch for the day. The APUs are vital to Columbia's safe ascent and entry for steering the engines during liftoff, controlling the aero surfaces during landing, and for lowering the landing gear. It was suspected that oil pressure rose in the units because the filters were clogged. The problem would have to be solved before another launch. Analysis revealed that a wax-like substance had formed in the oil to clog the filters. 
the substance was created by a chemical reaction between the oil and hydrazine fuel. The hydrazine seeped into the gearbox over the seven month period since the APUs were last used and contaminated the oil. Although many thought technicians simply forgot to change the oil, normal maintenance procedures did not require it. Indeed, a key factor in shuttle's reusability is quick turnaround with minimum maintenance. The APUs were flushed with new lube oil. New filters were installed and fresh oil was added. Working on a very tight schedule, ground crews completed the work within a week. The shuttle was again ready to be launched. Astronauts Joe Engel and Richard Truly, commander and pilot for the second shuttle flight. Commander Engel, who joined NASA in 1966, was part of the backup crew for Apollo 14 and the first shuttle flight. Three of his 16 X-15 flights went above 50 miles, qualifying him for astronaut rank. But he had not yet been in orbit. Nor had Richard Truly, pilot for this flight. Truly, who joined NASA in 1969, was capsule communicator for three Skylab missions and the Apollo-Soyuz mission. He was also part of the backup crew for Columbia's first flight. Both men had flown the shuttle before, in approach and landing tests at Dryden Flight Research Center in 1977. That was over four years ago. It was now 1981, November 12th to be exact. Richard Truly's 44th birthday. Countdown now being conducted by the launch sequencers on board the orbiter. The SRB nozzles have been moved to start position. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. We have go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Columbia on a roll. Columbia Houston, you're going at 40. Roger, copy set, looks good to us. Smooth and play as you used to. SRV set, flight. Roger, NSF. And 103, com 103 converged. Roger, got a 103. Okay, let's get a return status here. Final. Go. Booster. Go. Prop. Go. Ecom. We're go. Eagle. Go. Okay, we're go to proceed past negative return. Mark, negative return. Roger that. Sounds good. Status Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Miko holding 3 4. Yes, sir. Booster. Go. Go at 8, Capcom. Columbia Houston, you're go at 8. Roger, go at 8. And it's solid as a rock, man.
Okay, Houston, we got a good Miko. Miko. Roger, we copy. Roger, Miko. And we got a Miko confirmed. And confirmed. Let's get off the tank now. Got the Miami Bites flight. No problem. Ignore them. Okay. Ignore the IMU Bites, Capcom. Columbia Houston, you can ignore the IMU Bites. Roger, Houston, and we've had ETSEP. Roger on the SEP. Okay, let's get an Ohms 1 status here. On the nominal Delta V, 141. Roger, Ohms 1 status. Booster? Go. Prop? Go. Ecom? Go. GNC? Go. Capcom, we're go for nominal Ohms 1. Go for APU off. Columbia, Houston, uh, your go for nominal Ohms 1 for APU shutdown on time. Okay, Dan, and we're maneuvering to attitude now. Roger. As Columbia continued toward orbit, the SRVs parachuted to a safe landing in the Atlantic Ocean, 160 miles downrange from the launch site. They were recovered and will be used again on a later shuttle flight. All orbital maneuvering system burns were successful, putting Columbia into a 138-mile orbit around the Earth. The payload bay doors were opened to deploy the heat-dissipating radiators and expose the OSTA experiments. So began the many tasks of the five-day mission that lay ahead. However, not long after achieving orbit, at about two hours, 27 minutes, mission elapsed time, the crew reported a high pH level, indicating alkalinity in one of Columbia's three fuel cells. The cells, which produce electricity and water for the spacecraft and crew, are essential for operating the many systems on board. Flight controllers, having dealt with almost every conceivable problem during flight simulations, immediately began working to find a real-time solution to this problem. But meanwhile, the cell's capacity to generate electricity continued to deteriorate. At about five hours mission elapse time, it was decided to take the fuel cell offline and safe it, drain it of all its energy. This would prevent a potentially dangerous reaction from occurring that could damage the spacecraft. But according to a mission rule made pre-flight, the failure of a fuel cell would reduce the 125-hour nominal mission to a 54-hour minimum mission. A mission management meeting was held to decide whether to enforce or override the rule, whether to come home after 54 hours or stay up for the full duration. At a press conference on day two of the mission, Johnson Space Center Director Christopher Kraft explained why the decision was finally made to shorten the mission. Well, we certainly don't have any other problems on board. I think that we think it's the prudent thing to do uh, at this point in our test program. Uh, we think we can really get everything out of the mission that we have planned uh, with, the ex with the exception of time. So we just felt from... Uh, more prudent position. Uh, we had we had thought it out very carefully uh, pre-flight that uh, that was the best thing for us to do. Indeed, virtually everything was gotten out of the mission that was planned. All high priority objectives were accomplished, and 90 percent of the overall objectives were completed. Even though this was a test vehicle on a developmental flight cut short 71 hours. Of top priority were the remote manipulator system tests, completed on the morning of day two. Sally Ride, first female capsule communicator, guided the astronauts through the tests. And we've got a great picture from camera delta of the arm going down into the cradle. Hey, good. I tell you, the old eyeball looking out the window is the best alignment device, I think. And now we got a picture of the PLT moving the arm. The RMS, which is a major subsystem of the orbiter, is designed to deploy and retrieve satellites and other payloads in operational flights. 
Although the arm did not actually grapple a payload, the end effector was able to come within six inches of the target and maintain that position. Two very important objectives of the test. You can do that if, uh, if you get it locked up. Okay, we'll do that. We've got a picture of the flag back and we'll coordinate with ENCO. Super. Incidentally, uh, Houston, one of the things that has surprised me at least, I didn't think it'd be this way, but we have not felt the RMS move, move the orbiter at all. Okay, we copy that. Columbia, Houston, we've got the, uh, we've got the elbow camera. Okay. Hi, Mom. <laughs> In addition, all five operating modes of the system were evaluated, ranging from manual operation by the astronauts to a completely computer-controlled operation. The three and a half hours of tests done on the arm proved highly successful. A real tribute to the designer, the National Research Council of Canada, and the builder, Spar Aerospace Limited. Canada absorbed all expenses related to research and development of this first system. The first package of scientific instruments to be flown on shuttle from NASA's Office of Space and Terrestrial Applications was designated OSTA-1. Although all the visual results are not yet available from the shuttle data takes, each experiment has already flown on aircraft or satellites. The shuttle imaging radar instrument used side-looking radar to create map-like images of the Earth's surface, showing relief. When supplemented with previously recorded Landsat satellite data, which could identify rocks and vegetation types, the composite revealed geological structures of a type which could possibly contain valuable mineral deposits, such as oil. With the OSTA experiments mounted in the payload bay of Space Shuttle Columbia at an altitude of 160 miles, worldwide data was obtained, proving that sensors previously used on costly individual satellites could now be flown in groups on shuttle, along with low-cost commercial-grade sensors that could only be flown on aircraft before. This will greatly reduce the cost of such experimentation in the future putting it within reach of low-budget researchers. The ability to map Earth from space also demonstrated the potential for these instruments to map other planets, yet unexplored, even through dense cloud cover, as the shuttle imaging radar experiment was able to do. At the end of the second day, Mission Control had a special visitor. Joe, Dick, this is Ronald Reagan. Hello, Mr. President. Let me just say, I'm sure you know how proud everyone down here is and how this whole nation, I'm sure the world, but certainly America, has got its eyes and its heart uh, on you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. We're, uh, we're awfully... Uh, honored that we've got the opportunity to uh, to take part in this. We certainly do appreciate uh, your taking the trouble to show all the people working on the space shuttle how much you care, and it makes us mighty proud. Well, I care, and again, God bless you both, and all of us here are watching with great pride. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you. With all the Priority One objectives completed, the crew was ready to come home. Entry and landing would be their last test. For seven minutes, over. Roger, and the port door is coming closed, and I want to at least get it close here and stop the midwing talk. Okay, that sounds good, Richard. Okay, all operators, assume all of you have checked the configuration. I'd like to come around the horn and get a go-no-go -go for the Diogo Burn. Fido? Go. Guidance? I'm go. He's still maneuvering with attitude. Understand. DPS? We're go flight. E Command? Go. Ecom? Go. Eagle? Go. GNC? Go. 
Prop? Go. Booster? Go. Sergeant? Go. Enco? Go. Ops? FAO? Go. Pylon? Go. 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 Okay, Capcom. Columbia Houston, we have a go for the deorbit burn. Three minutes remaining in this pass. Super, thank you, Rick. The landing, like the first mission, would be at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Entry on this mission would test the vehicle's response to maneuvers not performed before. And the roll reversals will still be as updated. At Columbia Houston, the uh, roll reversals will uh, still be as brief. Uh, there will be no significant effect on that uh, early turn on the first roll reversal. Over. Roger, understand. Thanks, Rick. The first maneuver, done at the beginning of the communications blackout, was executed at Mach 24, the fastest speed at which manual control had ever been exercised in winged aerodynamic flight. Close to 30 maneuvers took place as the shuttle sliced through the atmosphere at speeds from Mach 26 down to Mach 11. At about Mach 10 and a half, Columbia was expected to regain communications with mission control. Columbia Houston through Buckhorn, configure AOS. You're about 25 miles south of ground track. Your nav is good. Your energy is good. We'd like you to check your TACAN, MLS, and radar altimeters on. Over. Okay, Rick, good to hear you. And we're showing 10.5 mark and 165,000 feet now. Roger, everything's looking good. Your energy is very good. The nav is good. The first visual sighting of Columbia was aided by plumes from reaction control system jets, which were fired during a pitch maneuver. 100,000 feet, Mach 3.6. You have positive seats. We have a wind update for you and a weather update. Uh, you've got a very thin layer at 25,000. The winds airborne are as briefed and on the ground 220, 18 knots, gusting to 24. Very good. Sounds like a good old Eddie day. Let me, Houston, we show you intercepting the hack. And a reminder, you've got the strong winds out of the west. Now out of 38,000 feet. Okay, thank you, Rick. And Rick, the maneuvers have been going very good. The bird is real solid. Good, solid bird all the way. Well, we love hearing it. Coming close. Roger, slightly below glide slope. You have a go for auto land. Okay, Rick. Thank you, sir. Okay, Rick. We're in auto. Check speed brake auto. Okay, speed brake, body flap auto. Everything's auto. Thank you. Okay, 2,500 feet, speed brakes are closed, we're at 270 knots. Chase concurs. Columbia is clear land, link at 2-3, wind 2 one Okay. Gear's coming. Three down.
100, 50, 30, 20, 10, 5, 3, touchdown. Nose gear 15. Although this second shuttle flight only lasted two and a half of the five and a half days planned, it did answer some formidable questions. The orbiter is truly a reusable spacecraft that can be launched again and again. Instruments in the payload bay can map Earth's resources on a global scale. And the remote manipulator system has met this flight's test objectives. The completion of this flight marks the halfway point in the shuttle flight test program. Columbia's third flight, a mission of up to seven days duration, is scheduled for the spring of 1982. The problems encountered so far are not unexpected during developmental flight testing. Indeed, it is only through such testing that confidence in the vehicle, its systems, and its flying characteristics can be built. The Columbia is a totally new concept in manned spaceflight. It needs very conservative, very comprehensive testing before it can become operational, making access to space something it's never been before. Routine. Twenty-seven times, roughly once every two weeks, the skids creased the desert floor. Twenty-seven drops from 41 tries chalked up an unparalleled research plane record. At the beginning of the year, the X-15 was new, almost untried. At the year's end, it was proven, a record holder, 
discovering more about hypersonic speeds and extreme altitudes. January saw the number one airplane make its final qualifying flight. Delivery to the Air Force and NASA started a new crew on acceptance check and pre-flight readying. Joe Walker, chief research pilot of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, was the first to show that the X-15 is not a one-man airplane. At this time, two X-15s were flight ready. Number one was involved in the Air Force NASA program to take the airplane with its present engines and push it to the limit of its abilities. And Joe Walker's first flight denotes the start of this research phase. The number two plane was still being flown by North American for investigation of stability, control, flying qualities. Flight routine, the landing uneventful. Two weeks later, another new face appeared. Major Bob White climbed the ladder to the cockpit to try his hand at rocket plane flying. An hour and a half later, the X-15 Pilots Club had another new member. The Air Force's project pilot had made his initial run and now was ready to start some serious research flying. The spring of the year saw a flurry of activity with two X-15s flying and North American racking up nine drops with the number two airplane. The Air Force and NASA alternated pilots on a separate series of nine research expeditions. Flights that kept inching up on the world speed and altitude records. Both company and governmental pilots kept investigating the flight abilities of the planes in different quarters feeling out the new machines, steadily pushing the operating area out farther, gaining confidence. All flying during this period was done with the XLR-11, the small engine package. Its thrust of 16,000 pounds was adequate for early investigations, but everyone was waiting for the big engine. The XLR-99, a brute that would blast out nearly 60,000 pounds of thrust to drive the plane to peak speeds and altitudes. This engine is installed in the third and last plane of the series, which has always been slated to be the test bed for this new power plant. And Crossfield uses his time in between flights to ring out the installation. Preliminaries are out of the way, and this run will be one of the final before flight. This long-awaited engine can be throttled having an idle output of 30,000 pounds, but able to be regulated between idle and 60,000 pounds of thrust. Today's runs are the climax of a long series of tests proving the installation. After this start, they're ready for flight. second years of planning, months of test and grinding work went up in smoke. There was only one real observer, one eyewitness, the pilot, Scott Crossfield. Scott, what was your immediate reaction? Well, it was the biggest bang that I'd ever heard. Fortunately for me in the airplane, the explosion blew the forward section, the tanks, and the cockpit out of the blaze, or out of the major part of the blaze. 
and the firemen were right on their toes and they moved in to blanket the tanks in the fire area with foam. The first reaction we had was that the engine had blown up, but like many first impressions, this was wrong. As soon as the parts cooled down, a disenchanted group of engineers moved in, and as you might imagine, things were pretty well scattered about. We also took a close look at the film that you've just seen, and here are a couple of frames that gave us our first clue. Just before the blow-up, a cloud of vapor appeared ahead of the engine. So the search was concentrated on this area. Following up this lead, we found that the hydrogen peroxide tank had been rammed, smashed open. But with what? Lining up with the tank is the center structure of the ammonia tank, and its shape matched the impacted area of the hydrogen peroxide sphere. But how could this part fail? Likely through overpressure. Now, a check of the instrumentation showed tank pressures far over normal. Again, the question, why? The pressure regulator was recovered and checked. It was determined that freezing caused by the very low temperature pressurizing gas had caused the regulator to stick full open. But there's a safety, a valve to relieve overpressure. This valve and the entire relief system was also checked. Here it was determined that a flow-sensitive relief valve combined with a vapor disposal equipment had created enough back pressure to fail the tank. So, a frozen regulator, a Foley relief valve, and a high back pressure relief system had gotten together and we had wrecked an airplane. The entire pressurizing and relief systems were analyzed, redesigned, tested, and retested. We ran the combination time after time, deliberately creating the most severe failures possible. Weeks passed before we and everyone else were convinced that the problem was licked. As a measure of how the confidence was restored, here is what happened on the 4th of August. On this historic date, Joe Walker let out a yip of joy. Yippee! He had just pushed the modified small engine airplane to a new speed record, then made his report to the public. Joe, how does it feel to be the fastest living human? I don't know if I feel much different than I did yesterday, except that the waiting for the flight is over, finally. did you reach your maximum speed? Uh, if you notice the vapor trail from the engine, at the instant it cut off, that was the point at which I reached the maximum speed. Now, what was your altitude then? Around 66,000. How long were you going that 2,150 miles? Just one instant. Then, on the 12th of August, just eight days later, Major Bob White was up before the cameras after his 136,500-foot record-breaking altitude flight. The flight today offered, uh, I would say, no problems and nothing that could be considered a limitation as far as man's ability to fly an aircraft. Once I pitched up and reached the highest climb angle, I was very definitely impressed that I was going, well, almost straight up. Of course, it wasn't straight up, but it, it appears to be that way from the cockpit. Are you coming up on 10 now? Okay. Angle's very good. Going through 11 now. What you see at this altitude impressed me as being the most dramatic 
point of flying at uh, over 130,000 feet. The very dark blue sky and the lighter band that was immediately surrounding the Earth, and then, of course, the many, many miles off in the distance that you're able to see. Looking to the future, I would say that we hope very much, and I would particularly like to continue on in, in work that would take us to uh, higher altitudes with manned aircraft. Now the full potential of the airplane with the small engines had been fully investigated. While the number two airplane was being fitted with the big engine, number one began a series of training flights. The full crew was now given a chance to try its hand at piloting the research plane. Commander Peterson, the Navy's representative, was the fourth man to ride the X-15. He made two flights in early fall. Then Jack McKay, NASA research pilot, took his first ride at the end of October. Captain Rushworth, the Air Force backup pilot, was next to show his skill at rocket plane flying. NASA pilot Neil Armstrong's last two flights closed the year. Training flights filled the gap while the number two was being given a complete checkout with the large engine. Since that ill-fated day in June when the explosion ripped the number three ship in half, maximum effort has been exerted toward getting another engine and installing it in ship two. Months of work, weeks of painstaking trials, round-the-clock days of final pre-flight, were at last put to the test on the morning of November the 15th. This is the X-15 in its final stage of development. This run, if successful, will mark the beginning of a whole new era of flight research. It's okay down here, Scott. Okay to go. Right. Roger. One of five. Top idle. Idle cooling going down. Got it. Launch. Turning off to the right, Scotty. The launch uh, tank pressure is going up to 60. And I'm going up to you. I'm reading 320. Large bridge is holding at about 55. Number 1, 2, that bridge should open. That was a look, Al. But real good, Scotty. You uh, made a, about a 10 degree turn to the right when you came off. With the new engine loafing at idle, the plane could go to four times the speed of sound. So the speed brakes are open to stay close to Mach 2. It's good, Scott. Let me ride, of course. You're okay. Fire on ready, Ralph. Scott, could you tell us in your own words how the flight went and what you thought of it? Very well, and the engine and its power is impressive. What was your maximum altitude and speed? Did you have a chance to check that yourself? Yeah, I got <clears throat> about 80,000 feet and a Mach number approaching three. Scott, your, your radio talk sounded a bit hesitant this morning before takeoff. What was that about? Oh, no, I think you misinterpreted that. Of course, we've been doing the best we can to get this flight off for five years. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> if there's any hesitancy there. <clears throat> Scott, having observed the... Uh minimum thrust performance of the engine, do you think that the uh, airplane now will be able to live up to its design promises of altitude and speed, or will exceed it, or how do you feel? Yeah, really without question, I got a little faster today than we'd planned, and we have in our previous flights, and my flights gotten faster than we'd planned, because for uh, once in history, we've underest overestimated the drag on the airplane. I think it'll exceed its original expectations. Just seven days later, the second flight was launched. And on the 6th of December, the third. Both showed the engine to have all the abilities claimed of it. These two eminently successful flights closed the year. But the story of the X-15 stands not in the past, but in the future, when every flight is a record breaker, when every trip away from the B-52 is an unparalleled research mission. Human hands will be learning a new skill, 
to thrust deep into unexplored areas, capture vital information, then settle to a safe return from that twilight land standing between Earth and space. The assignment was specific. Get photographs of the surface of the moon that are good enough to determine whether or not it's safe for a man to land there. But appearances can be deceiving. Just as deceiving as trying to get a good picture of, well, a candy apple. Doesn't seem to be too much of a problem. Just set it up, light it, and snap the picture. Easy, quick, simple. But it can be tough. To begin with, the apple is some distance away, so you can't get to it to just set it up, light it, and so on. To make things even more difficult, it isn't even holding still. It's moving around in circles. Now, timing is important. You have to take your picture when the apple is nearest to you, so you get the most detail, and when the light that's available is at the best angle for the photo. And even that's not all. You are moving too in circles. You're both turning and circling about the apple. Now, about that assignment. As the technology of man and space was developing, it became more and more apparent that our knowledge of the moon's surface as a possible landing site was not sufficient. To land man safely on the moon and get him safely off again, we had to know whether we could set up a precise enough trajectory to reach the moon. Could we design and build a spacecraft to land gently on the moon? Among all those lunar craters, could we find a place clear and level enough for a safe landing site? To make it possible for a man to land in the Apollo zone on the moon, better pictures were needed than those taken through Earth's best telescopes. In fact, better pictures might do more than find a landing site for Apollo. Scientists hoped they might resolve questions unanswered in the 300 years since Copernicus prompted Galileo to study the moon. What were the lunar craters Galileo observed? Pits dug by objects hurled from space, or the scars of old volcanoes? Telescopic photographs, far from answering these questions, scarcely reveal features on the moon as big as the meteor crater in Arizona, almost a mile across, and several hundred feet deep. Well, it wasn't easy. But three shots in a row hit specific targets on the moon. Exactly as they were planned to do. And the photographs started coming in. Ranger was designed simply to hit the moon. Before it crashed into its lunar impact point, it would send back to Earth close-up TV pictures of a portion of the moon's surface. The first successful ranger reached a small lunar sea, since renamed Mare Cognitum, the sea that has become known. Mark, it is one minute to impact. All cameras are functioning. As soon as the cameras were turned on, the pictures were transmitted to the tracking station at Goldstone, California. From here, they were retransmitted to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in nearby Pasadena. Here in the Space Flight Operations Facility, great excitement prevailed as Ranger neared the moon and its pictures came alive on the TV monitor. 
At last, scientists could turn to close-up pictures like these. 20 seconds for impact. All video good. Signal normal. Stand by for impact. 10 seconds to impact. Video still good. Excellent signal strength. Prints of each picture were made for immediate study by scientists and engineers. On the theory that all lunar seas were flat and would offer the best landing sites, Ranger examined the surface of two such areas. Surprising to some scientists, the photographs at first showed little evidence of any volcanic activity on the moon. No boulders, no rubble, no crevasses, no dust. Pictures of craters covering craters suggested that the surface of the moon was long ago dug into and loosened by repeated impacts. In Ranger 8 photographs, the first signs of volcanic activity on the moon seem to appear. The lunar landscape Ranger's TV cameras explored was bleak, a flat surface studded with craters. Some are miles across, others no bigger than a washtub. All were probably formed billions of years ago. The last target area was the floor of the Alphonsus crater, chosen because it was not a lunar sea. There was a lot of interest in the dark, smaller craters within Alphonsus, which might explain more about the forming of the lunar surface. On the Alphonsus floor, New signs of variety on the moon's surface began to appear. Craters caused by volcanoes long since dead. But the evidence from these photographs raised more questions than the pictures answered. It was obvious that some different perspectives were required on the subject. Perhaps a new camera, one that could get very, very close and another to cover a lot of ground in detail. Surveyor, a far more complex spacecraft, was designed to make a soft landing on the moon. But once safely down, it would also send back TV pictures of a possible Apollo landing site. The first surveyor worked perfectly, made its plan soft landing, and sent back more than 11,000 pictures of a small area in the ocean of storms. Surveyor's moon was dark and relatively smooth. But still studded with craters and littered with rocks. Its pictures made it clear that where it landed, there is little loose dust on the surface. But neither is this surface hard. It seems to behave much like earthly soil and will certainly support the weight of a manned landing craft. It supported surveyor's weight and offered a glimpse beneath the moon's surface where the shock absorber sank slightly into the material on which it came to rest. After transmitting the first batch of pictures and surviving the dry heat of a lunar noon, Surveyor slept. It slept through the 14-day long lunar night as temperatures plunged 500 degrees. Then it came awake on command to continue its examination of the moon. Surveyor took the first color pictures of the moon showing a blue-gray surface in contrast to the small color wheel attached to one of Surveyor's feet. In some ways, Surveyor's moon seemed more hostile than we thought it might be. Some feared that rocks littering even the smooth plains might present a landing hazard to any manned spacecraft. Well, the apple that started all this was still there. Our pictures were beginning to give us some of the answers we needed, but our coverage was spotty. We needed more pictures. 
more detail, more information. It hadn't been simple to hit the moon with Ranger, and soft landing surveyor had been exceedingly difficult. Lunar Orbiter presented a set of problems different from Ranger or Surveyor. It was designed to circle the moon with a pair of cameras to photograph large areas of the Apollo landing zone and give good close-up pictures of many possible landing sites. Somebody called it the Flying Drugstore because it develops its own film. The spacecraft also carries an electronic readout system to scan its photographs and send them back to Earth. Lunar Orbiter was an impressive advance in lunar photography. Here was a first close look at large pieces of the moon. 16,000 square miles of the Apollo landing zone with a resolution 100 times better than Earth-based views. For the manned lunar landing, scientists hope to find a string of sites in groups of three, each group a series of five-mile-wide ovals strung out in a straight line. Each site would have to be crater-free, have no large boulders, and no surface slopes steeper than seven degrees. Of all the areas photographed by the lunar orbiters, only a few were expected to prove smooth and level enough to meet all the Apollo landing requirements. The spacecraft photographed several suitable areas. Working with the photographs, scientists observed that the smoothest terrain appears to be the darkest. Using degrees of brightness as a yardstick has made it possible to measure the roughness of the moon's surface Really smooth areas are hard to find. Orbiter missions have resulted in the selection of eight possible Apollo landing sites. The most promising seems to be a broad plain on the southeastern part of the Sea of Tranquility, just east of the crater Maskelyne D. Its surface is flat. There are no deep craters, few boulders. The other seven sites stretch along the equator from the Sea of Tranquility to the Ocean of Storms. There was now sufficient data to pinpoint Apollo landing sites for the first mission. In terrain like this, the first lunar landing craft will touch down and man descend to take his first exploratory steps on the moon. Orbiter also photographed the far side of the moon and found it to be even more heavily cratered than the face. These were bonus shots made because the cameras had to be in continual operation until all the film was exposed. The first high-quality pictures taken of this area, they covered 80% of the moon's hidden face. One of Orbiter 2's bonus pictures was a shot of the crater made by Ranger 8 when it impacted the moon. The freshness of the crater was determined by measuring the brightness of the volcanic rock around the crater. Originally concentrated and dark in appearance, the material was now powdered and brightened by the force of the Ranger collision. Lunar Orbiter not only provided outstanding photographs of the moon, it also helped improve our earthbound measurements of the moon's shape and its gravitational field. Micrometeoroid sensors on board 
discovered that a spacecraft orbiting the moon has no more chance of being hit than one in orbit around Earth. Measuring radiation, Lunar Orbiter 1 experienced two solar flares after completing its photography. Flares that would have spoiled its pictures had they occurred earlier. Lunar Orbiter 3 photographed this great 400 mile long fault, half as deep as the Grand Canyon. And on another part of the moon, a mountain towering 6,500 feet from the floor of a crater. Other orbiter photographs reveal many craters filled with what is apparently volcanic debris. Here is a wealth of material for continued study by geologists and other scientists. For example, the crater Copernicus is one of the most prominent features on the moon. Until not long ago, this photograph, taken through the 120-inch reflecting telescope at the Lick Observatory in California, was the best available. This is Copernicus as seen by Lunar Orbiter 2. 60 miles wide, two miles deep, the crater dominates the face of the moon. Foth, the keyhole-shaped crater in the foreground, is about 13 miles across and nearly a mile deep. Thoth is 33 miles from Copernicus. Much of this distance is covered with debris blasted from Copernicus by the impact of a giant meteorite billions of years ago. Rounding the back shoulder of the moon, one orbiter got an exceptional shot. The first photograph of Earth seen from outer space. From afar, Earth seems shrouded in clouds, much as Venus has always looked. To scientists, this photograph suggests that Venus may not be hidden beneath a perpetual cloud cover. A TV camera close enough to photograph Venus may find holes through which to see this planet with greater clarity. Who knows what a closer look at the evening star will bring? What answers may be found? Or what new questions man may have to ask about the nature of the universe? Other surveyors have touched down near the Landsberg crater in the ocean of storms. And in the sea of tranquility, pressing their unmistakable footprints into the lunar surface. Like their predecessor, these surveyors took a good look at themselves and then turned their television cameras on the lunar countryside. One of the most unusual features of Surveyor 3 was its surface sampler. A five foot long arm with a hand sized scoop. This device was designed to dig into the soil to determine bearing strength and other characteristics. It dug several trenches in the lunar crust. It dumped samples of lunar material on its foot pad, allowing close examination of the freshly disturbed soil. In other tests, the scoop was deliberately dropped on the surface and pictures taken of the resulting dents and cracks. Another surveyor experiment used this alpha scattering device to determine the chemical composition of the lunar soil. At one point, surveyor's cameras interrupted their look at the moon to record this event, an eclipse of the sun by the Earth. The most important scientific conclusion drawn so far from all these photographs is that the moon's ancient surface is still slowly undergoing change. This has been caused mainly by the jarring impact of objects hitting the moon. But whatever the cause, the moon is not, as we thought, a perfectly preserved relic of the geologic past.
Lunar Orbiter has extended the mapping of the moon to the far side so that features there could be accurately located. And it also surveyed many important scientific sites. These pictures of the moon's polar areas disclosed striking new details. This is Oriental Basin on the extreme western edge of the moon's disk and stretching 600 miles in diameter. The mountains surrounding the basin are among the most massive on the moon, rising some 20,000 feet above the surface. Other areas of interest to scientists have been explored. What are the changing red spots that have been seen in Aristarchus? What makes the crater's wall so bright? What kind of erosion created the river-like channel in the Alpine Valley? Was it volcanic? Or was it, as some conjecture, the result of water on the moon's surface eons ago? What is the explanation of Cobra Head? How was it formed? Why are there certain color differences in this region? Near the Harbinger Mountains lie a number of curious craters with sinuous channels extending from them. Scientists will try to deduce what could have happened on the moon's surface to account for them. Because of the astonishing detail of pictures like these, the yield of information is great. For example, this rock is 75 feet across. From the picture, it is possible to tell that it rolled downhill some 900 feet, scraping away the lunar topsoil. This rock is only 15 feet across, but it too left a trail that can be clearly seen. Oblique photos of the Copernicus crater would seem to exclude it as a suitable landing site for a manned spacecraft. But a look at other Copernicus photos taken from a nearly vertical perspective reveals several promising possibilities, particularly here in the northwest area. And surprisingly enough, these lunar photo missions have shown scientists views of Earth no man had ever seen before. This is the first photograph of the nearly full planet from 215,000 miles away. It will provide additional information on the amount of sunlight reflected by Earth. Lunar Orbiter has successfully surveyed 99% of the moon's front face and significantly increased high resolution coverage of the far side. These pictures are likely to be the source of lunar surface information for many years and should contribute to a fuller understanding of the moon. If many other questions are still in doubt, some of the answers may already be in our hands. Examination of these photographs is not complete. And already they've produced miles of data tapes to be processed. And additional information is being returned so rapidly that it will take years to evaluate it all. In 1950, astronomer Fred Hoyle lamented that man had seen all he would ever see through even the most powerful telescopes. It was time, he said, to leave the Earth. Within a hundred years from 1950, Hoyle hoped man might be able to launch a rocket with a radio-operated camera and see the Earth as it looks from outer space. Much more has been done. The doing wasn't easy. The plans didn't always work. But when they did, they took us beyond the dreams of the 50s to a point where, within 20 years of Hoyle's modest wish, two Americans will actually land on the surface of the moon. In the meantime, there will be more great pictures like this now famous photograph. When this happens, Hoyle predicted, when we can leave Earth with a camera and move out into space, 
it is certain to make marked changes in our whole outlook on life. The apple is still there. At Cape Kennedy, the familiar shape on the launch pad, a symbol of the space age. The familiar countdown, the signal for a beginning. But the real beginnings of this mission, any mission, go back in time. A time when only the dreamers, the visionaries, could guess at what lay ahead. By official reckoning, the beginning was in 1958. The first small steps, legislation, a new agency, a table of organization and a determination to make it all work in a way never dreamed of before. The program did work. It is working. In less than two decades, an orbiting laboratory circled the Earth, its crew conducting scientific research and performing experiments, testing the limits of human endurance for long periods in space, duplicating scenes science fiction writers described years earlier. In less than two decades, the space program has reached a level of precision, of almost flawless routine performance, but such routines rarely generate the excitement, the glamour of previous years. Previous years when a small, single satellite could command giant double headlines, holding out the promise of dazzling achievements. The early dreamers and visionaries started the momentum. Two brothers from Dayton soaring above a lonely beach in powered flight. A professor from Massachusetts firing off a rocket. They started the excitement and it was a long time subsiding. Behind the headlines, the accomplishments, there was something else. Consider the thoughts of a modern-day visionary, Isaac Asimov, scientist, writer, eclectic watcher of space progress. In any consideration of the space program, it's best not to look upon it as a succession of spectaculars, I think, or to think of it as a kind of baseball game in which 
That side wins who hits the most home runs. We're doing something in space that's more important than the personalities involved or the individual feats. It's also to be remembered that the astronauts themselves represent the visible peak of a large pyramid, most of which, as far as the general public was concerned, was quite invisible. There are many things that had to happen, had to be in existence, in order for those astronauts to move out into space to safely reach the moon and safely come back. And there are faithful human beings tending those instruments, making those plans, designing the vessels, taking care of a hundred thousand small details that all the rest of us completely miss. If we concentrate on the astronauts themselves, it would seem that here we have a group of the very finest kind of Americans in a rather old-fashioned tradition. Uh, great family men, clean-cut adventurers, almost as though it were McGuffey's readers come to life. Uh, and yet, behind the lines, there are people, I am sure, from every kind of background, from the big cities, indeed from the big city slums, perhaps, uh, to farms, from mountainous regions, from the plains. It is, it is the product of a cross-section of America with a large representation, naturally, <laughs> of what we might call the educated groups, the engineers and the scientists. And in addition, I rather suppose, a great many foreign-born people, too. In the last analysis... And so they came, the people and the machines, marshaled and scheduled by a unique partnership of government, industry, and education. It was done because there was focus, a goal. Land a man on the moon by 1970. The goal was reached with six months to spare. Now the accomplishments of Apollo blend into a composite picture of success. And still our attention is riveted to the symbol, the launch. In December 1972, when Apollo 17 took off, the last of the launches that were then planned, I watched the launching at night. Uh, it was just past midnight, as a matter of fact. And I have never seen anything that was so awe-inspiring, really. It was at night, and suddenly the flames shot up, and the whole Earth lit up in a kind of pseudo-semi-daylight. The sky became a kind of tan. It was an orange light, not real daylight. But the whole world lit up in this weird light, and I had to wait a few moments before it took off. And naturally, that was a frightening thing, because simply because I was watching it, would anything go wrong? But it didn't. It took off and began to climb higher and higher and higher, and the light continued all over. We could see in every direction until finally it diminished and diminished and diminished, and the night gradually came back, and the stars gradually returned to the sky, and the sea gradually grew black. Nothing sudden, little by little, until finally Apollo 17 was just a bright star in the sky, moving, moving, growing dimmer, growing dimmer, 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 until one couldn't be sure which star it was, and all the rest was black.
And you know, it's a funny thing. No science fiction writer, as far as I knew, ever dreamed that the first step on the moon would be visible on television, back on Earth. We always had the notion that they would reach the moon and that man would know about it only when they came back and told them about it. So, you know, there are limits to the, our ability to predict. And in general, where we're not being completely fantastic, we are hopelessly conservative. With all the success and acclamation, there still are doubts and questions. You will frequently hear people ask, but what do we get out of it all? What's the good of going to the moon? So what if they get some rocks back from the moon? And again, this is a case of trying to judge the whole by the little tip of the iceberg. There are a great many things going on behind uh, that which is most clearly visible. There are all kinds of te technological advances in computer technology, in, in, in communications, uh, in engineering of all kinds, all of which can then be applied in other directions as well. There is nothing that will bear the label made through space technology in some of the in some of the less tangible advances. The fact that we can learn how to predict weather better is largely due to our weather satellites. But people forget that. They can watch uh, Olympics in Japan without constantly thinking, this is made possible to me for a, by a communication satellite. In fact, what is in a sense most wonderful, at the same time most frustrating, is that no one can tell what the most important aspect of an increase of knowledge may be for decades, perhaps centuries. And how many... The people trapped in an approaching storm don't have to wait for decades and centuries. They receive the benefits of space technology immediately. Weather satellites provide an example of down-to-earth applications of space technology, providing data on storms, temperatures, winds. The final result, the forecast, shows up on the evening news because the data is widely available to people around the world. People who use it to prepare long-range forecasts of greater detail, greater accuracy. Other satellites provide other answers. Answers only dimly perceived by scientists a few years ago. Men who knew only that they had to know the great enemy of the human race is ignorance. It's what we don't know that limits our progress. And everything that we learn, everything that we come to know, no matter how esoteric it seems, no matter how ivory towerish, will fit into the general picture, a block in its proper place, that in the end will make it possible for mankind to increase and grow become more cosmic, if you wish, become more than a species on Earth, but become a species in the universe with capacities and abilities we can't imagine now. Nor do I mean greater and greater consumption of energy or more and more massive cities. It's so difficult to predict because the most important advances are exactly in the directions that we now can't conceive. But everything we now do, every advance in knowledge we now make, contributes to that. And just because I can't see it, and I'm an expert at this, and just because I can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. And if we refuse to take those steps because we don't see what the future holds, all we're making certain of is that the future won't exist, and that we will stagnate forever. And this is a dreadful thought. And I am very tired when people ask me what's the good of it, because the proper answer is, you may never know, but your grandchildren will. Crystals from the moon provide focus for the dilemma. They yield immediate, instant information. 
Yet they hold out the tantalizing suggestion of greater knowledge for the future. In man's pursuit of knowledge, he asks how, not why. And as the velocity of invention increases, his questions tumble upon one another. The same year the Wright brothers flew their plane, Albert Einstein asked why. The pursuit, the questions, lead us to our nearest star, the sun. The basic source of all life, all energy on Earth. Without it, there would be no light, no warmth, no food, no life. The poet watches the sunrise and writes a sonnet. But the scientist looks at those huge outpourings of energy and begins to ask questions and sends spacecraft far into space to do the asking for him. In the process, he receives data which can help provide a better understanding of the sun and its relationship to the life processes on Earth. By looking up there, we begin to understand our life down here. If we look for a broader approach to what we have been calling the space program, then what we must do is to call it a planetary program. In other words, one of the important functions of exploring space is to understand our own planet and ourselves better. I mean, that's the name of the game. We've got to understand ourselves and the place we live on. And aside from just pure knowledge for its own sake, uh, we want to increase, increase the benefits for ourselves, not just material benefits, and also for our posterity. Well then, if we talk about a planetary program, that is, tackling the entire complex of, uh, complex of problems which involves Earth as a whole, and not just one small section of it, the greater problem is how to conduct and improve human society, how to improve and increase the balance, uh, the ecosystem balance of which human society is a part, in other words, we want to take a large look on Earth and deal precisely with those problems that concern everyone and are not specialized, and of which all other problems are special subdivisions, so to speak. Well, if we do that, it will turn out that some of them can't be tackled properly, except from the viewpoint of space or with knowledge that can only be gained through space exploration. But then space exploration... The search extends to the oceans. How does man live in an isolated, hostile environment for long periods of time? The answer from space technology will help man to live beneath the sea, to study its vast reserves of food, of energy. Energy. The oceans and the sun may provide new sources of vital energy. Work is underway in both areas of research and in others. Work which may lead to new techniques, new methods for powering the machines and equipment an urban society demands and needs to keep it functioning, and for the demands of future generations. The machines and the demands made upon them present other problems. Pollution, congestion, energy consumption. As the problems develop, new ways are being found to deal with them. Research in communications and aeronautics is leading to more effective navigation, air traffic control, noise abatement, and pollution reduction. The space agency's predecessor was concerned only with aeronautics, and that work continues today, assuming more importance than ever. And not only on the big commercial jets, but also on general aviation, the system embracing the small private plane, growing in numbers, demanding solutions. Research extends to the edges, where Earth and space meet. But now the distinctions are blurred. We begin to see it as an entity. Space shuttle contributes to the blurring, rising like a rocket, flying like a spacecraft, landing like an airplane. And Skylab, viewing Earth and space as one unified complex system for study. The most dramatic way of, of examining Earth as a whole is from space because that is direct one needs those pictures from space 
that dramatizes what otherwise we could only deduce and makes apparent to all, even those who don't think about it, that after all, there is that cloud-shrouded body, and that's all we've got so far, and we must save it. The search extends beyond ourselves, to other planets in our solar system, to Mars, the Mariner spacecraft, traveling for six months in the void of space, using the sun for energy, the star Canopus for guidance. The information it sent back gave us new insights into this planet which has fascinated man for centuries. It also gave us our first close look, pictures of startling clarity, pictures derived from the same technology with which we now looked at ourselves. And as valuable as they are, they don't provide all the answers. Soon, another spacecraft, Viking, will land on Mars and begin a new search, perhaps ending the speculation of years, and perhaps beginning new speculation. Mars is a living world we now know, thanks to our probes. It's geologically active, it has volcanoes, it has ravines. It may conceivably have life. I don't mean Martian princesses on eight-legged horses, but I mean as very simple forms of life in the soil. Uh, the equivalent of our bacteria or viruses. Even this would be of infinite importance to a biologist. Even the simplest form of life would represent, for the first time, a kind of life different from that on Earth. All the life on Earth, however various it seems, whether it's a human being or a codfish or a giant sequoia or a virus, we're all variations on a theme, one theme. If there is any life on Mars, however simple, it will be a second theme. And observing what's taking place on Mars, be able to deduce much more accurately what took place on Earth, with a, perhaps a greater understanding of the details of life on Earth. And another pioneer, reaching out to other planets once thought to be inaccessible, now within reach. It flies to Jupiter, takes pictures, then soars off through and beyond the solar system, beyond our comprehension of space and time. On Pioneer 10 is a plaque which carries uh, drawings of man and woman, of the spaceship itself, and various other symbols which an extremely intelligent finder can interpret uh, to give him some knowledge of what we are like, where we are, what we have done, and so on. It seems to me that when it is found, the chances are great will no longer exist. And it would be nice sort of soothing, I think, to think that somewhere in space someday, people will know, people, beings will know that we have existed and that in our short lifetime, we've managed to accomplish some things. We've managed to send an object beyond our solar system so that from that, they can judge what we were. I rather think that it's a proud thing to do. Coming parade. Along with the countdown and the launch, visible symbols of a program, an inquiry, a quest after knowledge and understanding. We give ourselves a hometown party, and the symbols are embedded in our consciousness. But the results of the journey can only be hinted at, and they'll only be known by those who hear only the echoes of the celebration.
Thank you.